Eh, Tom si è laureato in scienze dell'educazione in, in Belgio e poi dal percorso di scienze dell'educazione ha seguito un percorso di cultural management e, e si è andato ad occupare in particolare degli aspetti che riescono a facilitare l'apprendimento eh, delle organizzazioni. Quindi eh, in qualche modo in un terreno che è ponte tra quello eh, tradizionalmente scolastico e soprattutto accentuando l'attenzione alle dimensioni che nell'organizzazione favoriscono l'apprendimento. Grazie. Thank you very much. Good morning everybody. Good morning. Uh, I have a little problem to start with. Uh, I can do the presentation in uh, English, French, Spanish, Dutch. You can also do it in German if you want. <laughs> okay. In order to uh, make sure everybody is aligned, I'll, if I speak English, I will speak it very slow. Quando parlo italiano, parlo molto veloce. Faccio un cambio delle due lingue. I'm working at the uh, International Training Center of the uh, International Labour Organization, which is a UN agency. Uh, you'll see it right at the picture, it's uh, based in Torino, per questo parlo anche italiano. And we are a training center, um, training people all over the world, um, through normal training, traditional training, through blended training, through uh, online uh, education. And um, when I was studying at the University of Leuven already 20 years ago, in educational sciences, also with a focus on higher education, I started to question myself, um, now when I hear, let's say, contemporary thinking about evaluation, about learning, not a lot has changed, because all the vocabulary that I've heard uh, in different conferences about, here you focus very much on assessment and evaluation, formative assessment, summative assessment, uh, all the kinds of problematics that you're learning, this is not new, these are, let's say, things that move on. And when I went out of university and started to work in, in adult education, I'm starting to ask myself, let's say, are there different ways to think about learning in general? And that's when they invited me here to the conference, I will try to give you some entry points to think about learning and evaluation, but learning also in general, through a different perspective. And I've called it here, foresight. Sto parlando troppo veloce? Tutto bene? Okay, good. Um, I have quite a lot of slides here. Um, my presentation, um, I'm also very much connected with technology. I see a lot of mobile phones in the room as well. You will need it in my presentation because I will use it. I will tweet my presentation right after I've finished here, and you'll find my uh, Twitter handle, it's called Tom uh, One Bacon. And what I try to use in my presentation is also the following. Um, it's very, if you look at the world around you, uh, in the last 20 years, I said in the field of educational sciences, we moved along, but if you look around the larger environment, a lot of things have changed in terms of technology. Ten years ago, there was no, let's say, all the applications that I have right now. Ten years ago, the amount of information was much more reduced than what I have right now. So this is something that I also try to integrate at one stage. If you want to know more, because I only have here 25 minutes, which is not a lot, uh, our institution also has a program on uh, innovative learning interventions. It's a diploma course. and. I always will walk, work through the lens of uh, innovation. So let me quote the following uh, person, he's a future explorer, and he says, if we always do what we have always done, we will get what we've always got. And this is a bit the uh, thing, or the experience that I have moving all these years through education, training, and things. So we're looking always through the same kind of lenses. 
And also, in an educational context, when I work with teachers um, and actually introducing new models of evaluation, new models of technology, new models of learning, often I face this following situation. It's a situation of uh, resistance. Resistance because of technology, resistance because of a new paradigm, resistance not because people do not want to change, but we're all too busy. We're busy with other things and actually follow a lot of our habits. So my question here, are there ways or tools that we can use to change this way of thinking so that also maybe in a different way we would think about evaluation? And the questions that my two predecessors have asked are, are very complex questions. The relation between evaluation and learning. The evaluation between learning outcomes and learning. So maybe different tools will also help us to think differently about it. And in my presentation, as I will use a lot of technologies, and, and also connect maybe with the presentation later of, of Morton, I'm quite passionate about technology, but not because of technology as itself, but as a means. So every time I will introduce technology, I'll ask the following question. Do the new technology, whether it's a mobile phone, the computer, or the tablet, has anything to add in order to improve my pedagogy? Now, my talk is titled um, The Future of Learning. And uh, I was asking myself, if I have to talk about the future, um, what can I say? Because what's the future? Is it tomorrow? Is it in a hundred years? Is it in a two hundred years? So I went to consult to this uh, future professor. He's a future ex um, expert. It's called Jim Dater. And he says any useful statement about the future should at first seem ridiculous. And what I mean with that, it's a bit strange. Because imagine that I'm going to ask you how will evaluation assessment or anything like that look like within a hundred years. Think about that. How will the future of learning look like? How will the future of the university basically look like? This is an important question. Try to answer it for yourself right now. I'm going to use this statement and I looked, I googled basically, and I looked at people a hundred years ago, actually not that long, but 50 years ago, that we're trying to say something useful about the future. And I'm going to give you four examples. It's not about learning, it's about different things, but just look at the way they think about the future. This was a quote of the chief engineer of uh, the British Post Office. And he said, look, the Americans have need of the telephone, but we do not. We have plenty of messenger boys. I'm going to add another quote. And this is coming from the person, the lawyer, that actually was advising Ford Motor. This is only a bit more than 100 years ago. And he said, the horse is here to stay, but the automobile is only a novelty, the fact. Another quote, this is a funny one, because I was driving with a train. Rail travel at high speed is not possible because passengers, unable to breathe, would die of asphyxia, sickness. And this was only said by a doctor a bit more than a hundred years ago. And then I'll move a bit closer. Let's say, indeed, it was about in 43. This is Thomas Watson, he's the chairman of IBM. And he said, look, I think there's only a world market for maybe five computers. 60 years later, you know more. Maybe a last one that I will use, you will say these are not intelligent people, they are highly intelligent. Mr. Einstein said here, and this is only said in 1932, he said there's not the slightest indication that nuclear energy will be ever obtainable. So that is what Mr. Dater said, any useful statement about the future should at first seem ridiculous. Now, if we look at our context, what we're talking about today, learning and evaluation and assessment, I'm asking you just to talk one minute with your neighbor and think about the quote, how the future of learning, or more specifically on evaluation and assessment if you want, because that's the theme of the thing, but how will the future basically look like, and come up with a similar quote on that. And 
you basically can use your device, so don't look at Facebook anymore, but use it now to reflect. So what you basically do on your mobile phone, if you have if you have access to internet, you move to the website slide.do and you take in the following code H383. And there, after discussing with your neighbor, you add your historical quotes about the future of learning. Lo ripeto in italiano, puoi andare on slide o slide.do, metti il codice H383 dentro e voglio ascoltare di voi un quote sul futuro dell'apprendimento, evaluation assessment, che la gente dentro 100 anni vanno a vedere come ridicolo. Devi immaginare il futuro, diciamo, 100 anni da qua in questo film. Ti do solo un minuto di fare questo perché non ho molto tempo per finire e continuare con la presentazione, ok? Adesso io vedo tutto che entro. Hai accesso?
The world will be under technological control, no privacy. Il mio punto di partenza è il mio punto di arrivo. Imparare a imparare. You'll see what's happening now. I'm received in less than one minute, I think more than 35 historical quotes uh, out there. This already would be impossible without uh, technology. I'm going to link these quotes to some of the problems, challenges and trends that we are having now. And I'm starting with the following. It was research done by a consultancy agency and they were looking at the modern learner. And I'm not talking, I'm talking about you, the modern learner. And if you look what you're doing throughout the entire day, with all the different things that you do between distraction, between working, is actually in a normal way, day of an employer, so not a student, so someone who is working, he only can dedicate 1% exclusively to learning. That's about 20, 20 minutes in a week. And if you look what people are doing, it's about 28% there would be at the first sense, 28% basically people are controlling and emailing. 90% they dedicate to searching information, which I think is quite a lot. 14% is then dedicated to communication and collaboration among themselves, and only 39% is dedicated to the job that you're currently doing right now. So there's a lot of, let's say, different things going on there. There's the overloads of technologies. People are actually overloaded with not only apps, there's the overloads of information, that also we know, and there's also the overload of social media, the called weapons of mass destruction, which we should transform into weapons of mass destruction. So there's a bit of need for guidance, guidance and orientation uh, in this. And I say we need direction and we need orientation is because very important when I talk about technology and specifically the integration of technology into learning, also for evaluation purposes. If we don't have the right vision, we will go into the wrong direction. And if you go in the wrong direction, you know what is happening? It's very simple. If you're going into the wrong direction, technology will get you there faster. So, what I wanted to say, and now I'm going to connect it with a complete different dimension. I said, I'm an educational scientist, and I worked a lot with experts in educational fields. But one of my problems was that I needed to get some new insights about what I was doing and then suddenly I read one book that was called from Stephen Johnson where good ideas come from and he spoke about a phenomenon which is acceptation. And that's, you see the birds, is there someone who knows a lot about dinosaurs in the room? What's happening here, if you look at this bird, it had wings. And if you look through the evolution of this animal, the wings that it had originally were supposed to heat the body. It was for auto, let's say, the regulation of the temperature. Throughout the evolution of the species, this bird started to fly. So what happens is one function, the wings here, completely serve another purpose because we are talking from a complete different context. And the, the, the formula of acceptation tries to initiate that. So maybe from one discipline, educational science, we need to jump to another discipline to get new insights, to get new functions. That might sound very abstract, but I'll illustrate it with an example of education. What you see here is Gutenberg's um, the book press, so one of the major inventions also for education, otherwise we wouldn't be sitting here. And Gutenberg, you would say, he should be an expert in book press. Actually, Gutenberg was somewhere in Germany. One of his main passions was basically drinking wine. He loved wine. He went to study all the wine presses in the area, and from the knowledge he earns into wine pressing, he basically developed the book press. So my question here, if I talk about learning, evaluation, and assessment, are there disciplines where we could learn a lot from to gain new insights? You see, it happens all over. Like, for example, in New York, traffic problem was solved by studying ants. 
They saw that all day also this morning when I came through there was a lot of traffic. Engineers, they looked at ants and the behavior of ants and they said ants never collide. Why? Because they have these kind of sensors. So they started to use the sensors now also in the development of the auto industry. My question, to go back to learning and evaluation, are there fields where we could learn a lot about evaluation, which is by all the educational, let's say, expert fields? As a learn, learning expert, I look a lot at architecture, because architects know how you can learn in different spaces. If we talk about assessment and evaluation, could I look to another field, maybe, for example, sports, and try to extract what I could learn from that? And what I've learned is that there are also very specific methodologies to, that would help you to have more creative conversations about the future. And they're called foresight. If I listen to both Yap and also what Maria has been saying, they told me two things. The reality that we're studying has a very high degree of complexity. There's a whole tons of variables out there and we're not all <laughs> controlling them. There's a lot of uncertainty. So, in the field of educational sciences, it's not, let's say, a positive science where we could predict futures. There's too many complexities out there. So that's why, for example, educational research, qualitative research is one of our main goals, but foresight could help us. Now, what is foresight? Foresight basically moves into three different steps. First, you look at the world around you in the first stage, and you see all the signals, trends, and drivers that are happening around you. Secondly, you sit together with a group of experts, but from different disciplines together, and you try to envision alternative futures of a specific field. That's it in a nutshell. For that, we have developed uh, a toolkit. I'm not going to dive into it right now, but I want to give you some examples of how we go about it. The first step would be, if you look into the environment, could be the environment of a primary school, it could be the environment of the educational context in Italy in general, or in Belgium, and you try to identify what are the patterns that are currently changing here. You already, I heard patterns this morning, but there are many out there. So you try to list them, what are the drivers of change into your particular organizational or school context. Once you have listed them, you start to map them out together with a group of uh, experts. And once you have mapped them out, we have what we call the world of, let's say, change in, for example, evaluation or in another field. Secondly, what do we do? We do a bit of horizon scanning. And the field of education is quite interesting because on a yearly basis, I think almost towards the end of the year, any importance educational institution has something to say about the future of learning. I just extracted three important reports there, the, uh, the Horizon report, uh, the Innovating Pedagogy report from the Open University in the Netherlands, but there are about 15 of them. And they basically say, these are the trends that are going to happen in two years, five years, and 10 years from now. Also, if you look into the field of learning uh, evaluation. Um, this, for example, is an example of uh, Gardner, and he only looks at the future of learning technologies, and you will see, if I look to evaluation, learning analytics, and all kinds of related things are also mentioned there. Once you have done that, there are about 10 different methodologies to talk in a very structured way what is going to happen. So I'm going to focus on one event, for example, I would focus on the rise of formal assessment or in one specific trend that you see important. You sit together with a group of experts and you try to come up, okay, if this happens, what is the consequence of this? And what is the consequence of the consequence? And you will see that through these qualitative conversations, you'll get a view on the future in one particular trend in a much more complex way than when you would do a rigorous, like said, normal experiment. Here I did the experiment, for example, on the rise of pervasive computing. It has nothing to do with the theme of the day, but you see, you get a kind of complex discussion which goes beyond simple statements. Um, need to check the time and ask uh, how much time do I still have? Quanto tempo ancora bisogna? Più o meno? Due o tre minuti, ok, benissimo. Lo che voglio dire è che ci sono varie metodologie per 
diciamo, discutere sul futuro dell'apprendimento e non sono solo diciamo, le metodologie tradizionali, nel field di Forsyth ci sono meno 15 diverse metodologie per parlare strategicamente sul futuro in un dominio. Vi ho mostrato in Future Wheels, ci sono Trend Horizons, ci sono Scenario Thinking e secondo me dobbiamo aprire anche nel dibattito accademico altre metodologie per vedere un futuro potenziale che può complementare tutte le discussioni che già stai facendo nell'ambito e sono molto diciamo, connesso con ricerca diciamo, tradizionale secondo me c'è proprio un, complement un elemento complementare per esplorare eh, questo e, um, dopo la presentazione ti manderò anche diciamo, il libro con tutte le metodologie che abbiamo fatto e il risultato di questo lavoro l'abbiamo uh, integrato in un alfabeto se chiama il futuro dell'apprendimento sono più o meno 130 diversi segnali del futuro che noi vediamo nell'ambito dell'apprendimento 130 segnali che stanno cambiando diciamo, radicalmente l'apprendimento Um, noi, non so, noi siamo non solo in questo dominio, per esempio l'Institute of the Future che è connesso con l'Università di Stanford hanno creato sei scenari dove puoi vedere il futuro dell'apprendimento e due circoli che puoi vedere lì sono direttamente connessi con il tema di questa conferenza che è l'innovazione. Um, solo per dire che questa disciplina di, di foresight si sta integrando anche nel dibattito di eh, educazione e secondo me anche una possibilità di avere conversazione un po' diverso che la conversazione che abbiamo sempre su questo tema. 30 secondi. Um, when we talk about the, the future, we can talk a lot uh, about the future, but in the institute where we work, as I said, we are not an academic research, we do training, we do uh, workshops, we work along with governments, uh, trade unions, employer organizations, UN agencies, and we basically do applied research, so we're doing things. And for us, the best way to predict the future is to, to create it. So when we talk about new ways of evaluating, we just basically test it. We see how learning analytics could work in one specific field. We test out new technologies of the future of learning. The problem with that, as I said, it's not scientific research, it's uh, what we call experience-based learning, it's the hardest kind of teacher. It gives you the tests first and the lessons afterwards. So if you will read the booklet that we have been uh, reading, you will see a lot of things that we have learned from, from failure, basically. Uh, and for us, learning is the only way to turn failure into a success. This is the quote. If you ever go to Sweden, uh, it's not Norway, more than it's Sweden, uh, it's the Museum of Failure is there, and this museum collected all the failures that happened in mankind. And I can assure you, there were a lot of failures also in the field of education, learning, and training. But the most important thing is that you can learn from it. I will stop here. I would like to engage in discussion uh, later. Ti uh, ringrazio e scusa se ho parlato troppo veloce, però continuo in italiano dopo. Grazie. Io credo che sono tantissimi gli stimoli che vengono dall'intervento di Tom. Eh, una cosa mi sembra importante soprattutto per chi si accinge a, a pensare un futuro da insegnante. Il modello tradizionale che abbiamo sempre pensato è che prima eh, finisco di imparare e poi insegno ed è sostanzialmente sbagliato tutti quelli che finiscono di imparare non possono più insegnare l'unico modo di insegnare è continuare ad imparare l'unica cosa che possiamo trasferire è il nostro gusto e la nostra passione per continuare ad imparare e non quello che abbiamo imparato ma possiamo trasferire soltanto quello che stiamo imparando eh, costantemente Io credo questa sia una lezione importante per tutti noi che qualche volta siamo tentati di insegnare cose delle quali eh, siamo sicuri.